Well, welcome to this meeting of the South Burlington School Board. Um, our uh, next item is to hear from the public regarding matters that are not otherwise on the agenda, if there are people here with comments about matters that are not on the agenda. So if that's where you're, where you're at, speak now. All right. Uh, that takes us to uh, an update on the current status of the Howard Center's permit to open the methadone clinic at 364 Dorset Street. Wynn, do you have a report for us on that? I do. Um, as far as the update, the environmental court uh, permitted some additional filings on the motion to stay. Uh, an affidavit uh, fr uh, from Twin Oaks Counseling stated that the clinic would pose a danger to students and there's an expectation that there may be other affidavits coming soon. Uh, also, the court ruled on a motion uh, a week or two after the Howard Center submits its last filing. And the third point uh, is a, a creation of a discovery schedule for the case, meaning the dates when parties must request certain information from each other. And finally, uh, the Howard Center has filed motions to dismiss uh, some other parties as not uh, not having standing or not having a, a legitimate interest in this. So that's that's where we are today. All right. Are there any questions? Thank you, Wynn. We appreciate your report. Uh, that takes us to a new agenda item tonight. If we're ready for it, and and we went, we might not be, but if we are, we're, we invite our student representative to make a report. If you have one for us. Um. Well, uh, yesterday was the Career Job Expo that the CDC does. So that was really cool. It was um, a success. I think there were 81 companies, Ms. Lavarnway said, that were there. And um, they had, like, this huge raffle, and, like, a lot of kids won prizes. And um, so that was really cool. And they sectioned them off by, like, career types, which was a little bit different than um, in the previous years. So that was nice. Um... I think that would be the biggest thing. Right. This weekend's um, the Dartmouth Model UN conference, so about 30 students are going on that, so that should be fun. Um, those are the two biggest things that come to mind. Um, I talked to uh, Mr. Phillips today about the testing and the test scores um, relative to like before when they implemented that policy of like not having to take a math final or a science midterm. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Phillips said he thinks there's like about a 10% um, increase in students who performed at the pr proficient or above proficient level. So that was um, really significant. So they think that's um, due to the new um, incentive. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that takes us to our, our next item, which is the superintendent's report. And... Superintendent Young is not here this evening. He says has another commitment this evening. We do have his written report, which um, describes the fact that uh, a letter was sent out to school choice parents um, who were not selected to attend South Burlington for next year, indicating that because of a change in the law, uh, we won't be able to accommodate those students. And that we urge those parents to contact the, their legislators and urge that the law be changed. Sad fact, but uh, but a true one. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else on the superintendent's report. When did, did David give you anything to add to no, what just, we have in writing? No, just that the Pat Burke's letter is also attached to the uh, to David's update. And I, I'm assuming you've had an opportunity um, to take a look at that. And I, and I know that David has been in conversation with the three superintendents that are uh, that are have interest in this this topic so that's an ongoing conversation okay. thank you and uh, that takes us to administrative reports the first of which is the climate committee update and I see some oh yes we missed one piece I'm sorry we did okay. uh, school choice now that we finished that David wanted me to talk a little bit about the restricted access and where we are with uh, the new system that's been uh, been installed in all the all of the buildings, and I would just report that uh, every one of the schools now has a has a camera, 
uh, where a visitor to the school comes to the camera. There's a sign on that uh, that asks them to push a button and that the admin in each of the offices have a protocol to buzz people in after they state their business, why they're, why they're coming to the school. They sign in uh, in the office and have a visitor, a visitor pass. Uh, and that seems to be working quite well. We're making some slight modifications because it's hard, I think, for people to get in the habit of these aren't directly on the door, they're beside the door. Mm -hmm. And to be able to kind of go to the, where the camera eye is and, and be recognized. We're also, because of sunlight and backlighting, uh, when it's really bright, and we're looking forward to lots more bright days uh, soon, is that we're putting a little angle on these so that uh, the person that's operating the camera on the inside can actually see their face. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult. So we're, we're working through that, uh, and, it's, and it seems to be, it's certainly not the only answer, but it's one of those, um, one of those ways to kind of control a, a bit better who's in the school and knowing when they're here. And I'm sorry, I missed this one, but are the, is, are the buzzer systems in place? The buzzer systems meaning? Uh, to be buzzed into the building. Yes, that's all part of the that's same. That's all part unit. of this. Okay. There's a camera and a buzzer. Mm -hmm. It's audio, it's visual, um, video, and it enables us to uh, see people before, uh, okay. before they come in. Understanding also that in the er early morning when school is opening up, that the doors are unlocked, and in the afternoon after school they're also unlocked. It's it's really uh, operational in between those times, and that's that's when we're we're managing that process. Any other questions? Okay, thanks, Wynn. And that takes us to the uh, climate committee update. And I see some people here. I don't know whether they're here for that subject or for the next one. But, they, they are. Uh, okay. Uh, so Sabina is here. And Nisha is Nisha is here, and they're going to introduce. Um, there are uh, individuals that uh, will also support them in this presentation of the climate survey. Great. Where should we stand? Uh, this is you're, you're probably good as good as anything, yeah. I, I would think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> um, my name is Nirja, and I'm a 10th grader at SVHS, um, and you all know Sabina. Um, so we have been working on the school climate committee. Um, it was founded in October 2011 by school counselor Chuck Soule um, and a group of SPH students, staff, staff and parents, including Peg Adams, Jace, Jason Kushner, Carol Davidson, Philip Galga, Marcy Murray, and Susie Merrick. Um, they dedicated their time to understand our community so we could all feel safe in the environment. Um, we feel that this uh, topic is very important um, because peer-reviewed educational research has constantly demonstrated that a positive school climate is associated with academic achievement, effective risk prevention efforts, and positive youth development. Um, in the spring of 2012, a National School Climate Center survey was given to SBHS students, and that had over 83% um, of the students responded to that. Um, the staff, which had a 100% response rate, and parents and guardians, and that was a 38% response rate, which is considered excellent for that stakeholder group. And the results of this survey showed that we have much to be proud of as a school community, and um, it was overwhelmingly in the light blue range, which is considered positive, and um, it gave us a clear direction for next steps, specifically in the sense of social-emotional security and social and civic learning, which rated neutral for all stakeholder groups. Um, what we're doing now is that we meet every other week um, since September of this year. Uh, what we do is we ask deeper questions and address data that involves subgroup feedback. Um, we do this by a variety of different steps. The first is the survey results. Um, according to the U.S. Department of Education, a subgroup of 30 people or larger protects the privacy of individuals. Um, and we had several of our sub subgroups were smaller than 30. Um, this is really important, we think. And because of this, we had to combine a lot of subgroups um, so that the privacy could be remained intact. Um, we study these results and make sure the data is accurate. 
Um, and then we also offered a follow-up survey on the results of the National School Climate Center survey at a table in the lobby on February 20th, and 288 SBHS students responded, which is really great because that's about a third of the school, and it was just a table in the lobby, so that was nice. And then um, for parents and guardians, we offered a Survey Monkey follow-up survey on the results of last spring's professional survey, and it's still open for response. And then for staff, um, we're going to offer a Survey Monkey survey to the staff members, again, on the um, results of last spring's survey. And we also held a dinner and discussion event on March 20th with invitations extended to students, staff, and parents and guardians, where we talked about the results of the survey and brainstormed ideas. Um, so our next steps um, are include, we are having a half-day retreat on Wednesday, April 10th to analyze the results uh, from the second round of surveys and discuss possible ideas to address the concerns. Um, and our goal continues to be to retain and build further a positive school climate where we as individuals feel free to take risks, embrace challenges, and grow. Um, yeah, and we'd like to wrap up just to talk about why uh, Sabina and I joined the Climate Committee. Um, the reason why I joined the com Climate Committee was because I really feel that it's, import that it's important um, that students feel comfortable in the community and, um, it, and also places that um, we go on a daily basis like the school. Um, I know as a student that I may see things that parents and um, adults may not see and I believe these th um, things and aspects should be recognized. And for the same reason as Mirja, I wanted to um, be able to give a student's perspective on things and like help make the school a better place and see what we can do to really make it better for our community. Thank you. Thank, well, thank, you. thank you. I don't know if members of the board might have questions for you. If we do, we oh, will. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any? I do, any? I do have yeah. a question. Go ahead. Um, I'm curious on the, <clears throat> when you group together the subgroups under 30, uh, uh, my question, I understand the issue of maintaining privacy and then, you know, getting a group big, uh, larger than 30 to, to maintain that statistically, but I'm curious as to is there a way to blind the data so or blind the, the respondents so that y we get an understanding of are there subgroups that are under the number of 30 that may have different feedback on comfort level and feelings of safety within the school that we're missing by combining that data with other subgroups to get a statistical sample? That, that may be a tough question for you guys, but... Yeah. Um, we can defer that. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a lot of discussion about this, and it was very Imagine. and that's what took us so long. Yeah. And for example, so the subgroups that we combined there were two situations where we did that. We combined um, Latina Hispanic students with Black African American students, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> the reason we did, did that because they were um, under thirty. And when it's a really good question, and we feel like they had very similar profiles, mm -hmm. but there was like one category that was lost in one. So say there were five indicators versus two. There was social, emotional, and civic learning that jumped out for most groups. This group had, um, thank you, had four areas, one, and <clears throat> there was overlap in three. So, and let me just double check that to make sure that I'm accurate. That's not right. That's just, I think actually three or four areas that overlap, there was one that was left out. Mm -hmm. And we felt like it was worth making that compromise to make sure that specific groups weren't targeted. That. You know what I mean? It, it just didn't feel comfortable to us to do that. The other area that that happened with was we had parent professionals had a separate category, mm -hmm. as well as our custodians and <coughs> folks, bus drivers, mm -hmm. and we combined those two together. Again, their data separately. Someone could say, "Oh, well, these five people have this opinion," mm -hmm. and they felt uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to see that at some point, I could show you the, what what one piece that left out. But we haven't lost it as a group. Yeah. That's, that helpful. That's helpful to understand that the group has visibility to where there may be slight differences or, or areas of concern by the subgroup. Yeah. So. The message got through. The main, okay. I, I think the main message got through, and that's what was important to us. Great. Thank you. Yeah.
Other questions? So this may be my own ignorance, so I'm sorry ahead of time if it is, but I got a, as a parent, I got a survey recently, what I think you're talking about, and then shortly after that I got a, a thing from the guidance saying that was sent an error. And so I didn't bother to do the survey based on that. So I'm wondering, are you thinking people are going to do it? I mean, I, I, do you know what I'm? Do you no, know my problem? Was the first one we sent out. Mm -hmm. um, it was supposed to be a survey uh, monkey link, and what happened? It came as a PDF file, so there wasn't enough space for people to write in it, and that's not what we wanted to have happen. So there was a mistake in how it was sent out. So um, we resent it as a so there's a link in the second one. Got it. I yeah. get a lot of mail from school. What's that? I get a lot of mail from yeah. school. Yeah. So, it's my fault. And we, we realized it on the night we sent it out and felt like, oh, this is not good. Yeah. Okay. And so we sent it out as soon as we could the next morning. Great. Thanks. Yes. Okay. I also have a question about that. I received the survey. And the question, as a parent, and the questions are more descriptive. So I wondered how you'll sort of put that information together and report out on it, it's more, they're more, instead of saying yes, no, or, you know, it's not on a scale, it's why do you think this is mm -hmm. happening, how, how do you think you might report out on, on what people's perceptions are right. about safety and climate? Well, just to back up, the reason why we did send it out is we needed clarification. We had areas that were identified as concerns, and there were specific, we went through the questions that people asked that what people were asked and say there were 10 categories under social emotional, the social emotional category. And we noticed that there were some that were, you had a more of a negative slant to them. And so in terms of the response rate, so we said, what does this mean? Some of them we know, okay, we know what this means. You know, others it's like, Wait, what, what does this mean? We gotta ask questions. So that's why we're asking the questions and that's why they're specific. Um, and what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be meeting next Wednesday morning, the whole group for four hours and we're gonna start going through all of this information and trying to make sense of it. And we deliberately, we could have said yes, no, but we wanted words. We wanted more, we wanted um, statements. We wanted to hear specifics about what people were. were. And will you report the, that out on that at some point when you sort of categorize people's responses? We certainly can, okay. yeah. And um, we did, um, uh, when Sabina, you were speaking about the uh, event we had in the lobby where we asked students, same, so we're going back to each group and asking specific questions about the survey results. And the students had some powerful insights, and we'll report those to you, too. And we got a deeper, we're going to a deeper level, and that's what we're trying to do. And it's a, we're all trying to be patient, because we all want to get to the action piece. And we're almost there, but we're trying to do a thorough job and make sure that every subgroup is respected and honored and heard. Thank you. Great questions. I have a question for our students, and, and that's really whether um, you have the support that you need from the board in terms of doing this work. Is there something that you're lacking that we could do to help make this very important work go forward? And that's not a question that you have to answer tonight for all time. You could come back to us on that if, if that was not the moment to do that. Um, I think we have pretty good support, um, just in general. At least that's how I feel. Great. All right. Well, thank you. We appreciate it. And that takes us to um, the re administrative report on the Big Picture Program. And we have some written materials on that, which we've had a chance to look at. But I think we also have some people here to talk with us. Is that right? We do. OK. And just to kind of set some context, uh, in addition to the good work that the students did here, uh, the Big Picture program is a school within a school, and it's highly sought after. There are two in the state. There are a few around the country. Um, but it's part of kind of the multiple pathways that you're starting to hear about in, in high school transformation, and this is a, a wonderful example of that. And I'm going to ask Jason to uh, give you a little bit more of uh, what's behind the scenes. Jason and... Uh, and uh, my name's Christian. Yes. Yeah, I brought uh, a student with me because I feel like this is the best way to see what we do. So I'll let Christian start. Okay, my name is Christian DeBrule, and I am a senior in the Big Picture program. Um, I started the pro in the program when I was a sophomore. So this is my third year. Um, if I could explain it, and he asked me to explain it in one sentence earlier, <laughs> I would say it's, uh, <clears throat> it's a place where you can turn your passions into your learning. 
So um, for me, you know, I have a variety of passions and it kind of changes all the time. That's just how I am. <laughs> but uh, um, some of the internships I've worked in the past have been with Mount Mansfield Media. So if you see, and there's some SB grads who, who work for Mount Mansfield Media, but um, I worked on a few commercials with them and then I kind of transferred into this whole law enforcement type deal and I started doing an internship with Department of Corrections, probation and parole, where I was shadowing probation and parole officers. And now, currently, I am with the South Burlington Community Justice Center, um, the reparative board. So I serve as a member on the board. Um, so what, I don't know if anyone is familiar with what restorative justice is. So pretty much um, it's kind of like a court diversion type thing. So instead of going to court, they come and see the board, and then they kind of work out a victim impact and how that affected the community, and you develop a contract from that point on. Um, and so I am involved in helping make the contracts for, for people. Um, an academic project that I'm working on right now. Um, my senior thesis project is a weightlifting competition, which is coming this Sunday. Um, and it is to benefit the South Burlington Veterans Memorial. Um, and I'm really excited for that. And I just, we kind of had to go after a cause that was important to us. And that, that really stuck out to me as something that was important in the community and in in the bigger picture of things, uh, big picture. <laughs> yeah. And then how I've grown personally recently, you know, I've kind of, I've kind of opened up a bit in the program, being able to talk to people in the community. Um, and recently, you know, I kind of it came to me that the dreams that I had weren't really my own, and that I kind of needed to find things. Um, I kind of needed to search down deep inside myself to find out what my passions really were, and, uh, and I think I found them. So, great, that's awesome. And and one other kudos to Christian, or he deserves many. So he actually just got off his internship at seven o'clock p.m. Um, and then came straight here. And so a huge thank you for him for doing that. Uh, one show the hours he's putting in and uh, beyond school, and then also to come over to the board meeting. So a uh, huge thanks to Christian. And also, you all should come, and you're welcome to participate if you want in the weightlifting competition uh, <laughs> Sunday at the high school. Um, thanks. And so just a little bit of, about Big Picture. Uh, and where Big Picture comes from is like uh, Pat Burke and people at school felt like there's a certain population that wasn't fully engaged in the high school. And also, like our world is changing so much uh, that we need to create a school that is working to keep up with innovation and change and engage students. And so that's kind of the impetus for big picture. And so how we do that is really through creating curriculum around students' interests and internships. Uh, and, and one of the main vehicles we use is like student, we have one advisor for a group of students who really creates a strong relationship with them, knows them well, and creates their own pathway. And that can be a combination all our students do internships, they do independent projects around those internships, they do projects, and also they take classes. We have a lot of students who are taking college classes. Uh, Christian's at a, taking a course at Champlain College, uh, it's top edge judge on criminal justice something or other, that's too complex for me. Um, <laughs> and so like a lot of our students are doing dual enrollment, stuff like that, so they're getting college credits in high school around their interests. They're doing criminal justice, they're doing graphic design, they're doing women's history. So it's, you know, they're using all, that one person is helping them create their own individualized academic path. Um, and, and one of the things I think we're really doing well is like balancing your four pillars of the, of the ENDS policy. I mean, uh, so students are doing rigorous academics around like they love their learning because they're learning stuff they love. So they're really creating a passion for lifelong learning. Uh, part of our uh, graduation requirements are personal development. They do a whole strand on it. For junior year, they do a big presentation and reflection on it. And then also civic and, and social are being a good citizen. They are out and continue doing internships. And all of our seniors do a major capstone project uh, for service. And so we really are, I feel like, combining those uh, well. Um, yeah. <coughs> and so, uh, yes, yeah, so we have students doing internships all over the city. And also, students can change their interests. Like Christian talked about, like we had one student who came in. She's like, I want to be an architect. So we got her an internship as an architect. 
And she's like, I hate architecture. Uh, and we said... So that's I, a kind of success. Exactly. Yeah. We saved, we just saved you a couple hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> so, um, and then she tried an ambulance. She loved that. She found out she loved medicine. So now she's at St. Mike's to get uh, to uh, be a physical therapist. And she's successful and very happy with that. Um, also, in, in terms of dual enrollment, we've been going through the process with uh, Burlington College. They love what we're doing. They think some of our work we're doing with students is like enough to get college credit. And so we're in the process of seeing if we can kind of have them be almost a dual enrollment where they students could finish big picture and have their first year of college completed. And so they do some courses with us. Our students might go over there and do some courses. So that's one of the other uh, options we're working with. Uh, so that's moving along with Burlington College. Uh, one, one struggle we're having right now is around the school choice uh, new legislation. That, that has been a significant hit to us because I'd say 20 to 30 percent of our students we have been getting through that the school choice, not just the tuitioning students, but local schools, and, and we've seen a huge drop in that this year. We have, we have a few parents that are, uh, of the 21 people in the lottery, I think four or five of them are big picture uh, students, and so they're, we're trying other methods to see if they can get their petition their school board to come in or something like that, because those, those are very motivated parents, but I think we've seen a real decline in that. Um, and I feel like uh, overall we're having a lot of success. I don't know if you all read the other paper, but we've been in there like every other week for the past like two months with cool projects our students are doing. And also just one invitation. So part of a couple things that we do is uh, we students do exhibitions, like presentations on their learning. And so uh, the week of April 15th through the 18th, all our students will be doing presentations at 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. So you're all invited. And then actually a big night is a senior thesis project night. So that's where all our seniors are presenting on their capstone projects. And that is April 17th from 6 to 8.30. And so it's a huge event. It's really neat. People from all over the state are coming for it. And so, so we'd love to have you there to see what we're doing. Um, yeah, that's it for me. And so if there's any questions for either Christian or Fry, we, we'd love to have them. I have a question. Yeah. So, hi, Christian. Hi. We're neighbors. So, yeah. um, <laughs> so I, I, I asked for some trending data about the numbers in Big Picture, which yeah. I got in the supplement. Um, but. It looks like next year's projection is pretty good, so I'm wondering, are, does that include those people that you're talking about with school choice? So our projection for next year was that we were going to be increasing uh, student population, and mm -hmm. right now, I'd say the trajectories were going to be about the same. That's my guess. I gave you the data. Okay. Um, and w and we, we have, we did take, we were trending towards increasing next year. We're shooting for 45. Okay. And the reason we're not, we're going to probably gonna be around 30, are twofold. Um, school choice, I think, has been a hit for us. That's the not as good reason. The good reason is we're also graduating about 16 students. So mm -hmm. we're very excited for that, but also it's like, oh my god, here goes half our community. And so, so how do you decide, do you target certain students? I mean, how do you decide to bring students into your program? Great question. So I can tell you what our admissions process is, which we've really refined over the years to find students who are a good fit, and I think it's great. Mm -hmm. And parents love it. Um, and students like fill out a written application, we have an interview, and really that interview is about making sure it's parents and students really know what they're choosing, and so we see it's a good fit, and then students do a follow-up, and that's a great process. Um, I feel like marketing is like a place we, we're trying. Mm -hmm. We put posts around the school. The guidance is awesome about helping people. We try and get the word out. Um, but I'm not sure how best to get the word out, and, and that's, you know, that's not my area especially. I've like tried some stuff. We tried posters. We had, we had actually put an ad in... Uh, like seven days once, so mm -hmm. said for our exceptional senior program, because we also have this great program where students who have done their three years in the high school want to try something really, you know, different, and they really have a senior year that's exciting. They uh, they can do their senior year. It's been really successful. This is the first year, uh, but we got, got a call from a, like an 85 year old lady saying like, "Oh, I'm interested in your exceptional senior <laughs> program." So I feel like the marketing and outreach is a place Life we can learning. use help and growth and yeah. advice. So okay. yeah. Okay. Thank you. I wondered um, I, that you're, you're taking incoming ninth graders next year, and yes. I wondered what the response was like, and do you have very many coming in as ninth graders? Great question, great question. So we just, we had not been taking ninth graders previously because we weren't sure their maturity and you know make sure the program was solid. But uh, we feel like we're in a place to take ninth graders. We actually have one ninth grade ninth grader this year. Uh, she's from MMU, and she's loving it and doing really well. So we feel like, okay, I think we're ready to open up ninth graders. So we came and talked to some folks down here, here at the middle school. And so right now, I think we've had, we have like, this is just ballpark, but like three or four uh, students from Tuttle who are, who are looking at coming over, and probably 
three others from outside, and, and so they're not guaranteed because one of those actually was the school choice like lottery winner, um, and then the, the rest of them are going to see if they can work something out in their district. So, Jason, the, um, I, I was curious because there's only two of these kinds of programs in the state, and the point of the school choice legislation was to open up choice. Um, it was, was there any exception discussed for these kinds of programs? Currently, no. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something we thought a lot about, because originally we requested to be a, like a tech center. Right. And I won't go into all the politics around that, but they said that probably would not be a good route. And the Agency of Education has the, has the one to do this like transform schools route. And so we're in the League of Innovative Schools, mm -hmm. but there's no real legislation to support that choice around there. And so, I mean, we've talked to them. Pat Burke has been amazing at mm -hmm. doing everything he can to adjust school choice, but right now there's no good pathway for, for the funding. I mean, because um, I'm sure you all know, like, school choice is open, but the funding doesn't have to follow the students. So that's what makes it. And then one of the other questions I had, and I know it's been a, a challenge with the program, the transferability, or the, uh, the kind of the way colleges look at high school experiences, mm -hmm. and how, how has the program changed, to, and, you know, what's, what is the opinion of colleges that some of the students may be looking at, or, you know, maybe, maybe they're not, but is, is that trans, a transferable competency? Definitely. In fact, what I've noticed is there's a lot of concern and fear from other people around that, mm -hmm. but there's been no issue with it. If you talk to our this coming seniors, they say that they've gotten to better schools before because of going to big picture, um, as opposed if they would have stayed in the conventional uh, system. And what they say, and also we found this, we talked from admissions counselors, and there's lots of students who have good GPAs, who has lots of activities and good test scores. So then what can you do to set yourself apart? So when you have a senior thesis project or a major project and internships and all these experiences, it really can help you, these students stand out. So our students, our seniors here, mm -hmm. um, and like one of our students who came in was a solid student and actually had the same concern, is now really excited because now he got into better colleges than he thought he was able to because of being a big picture. Um, and, and we really handcraft each transcript. So each student is so unique in their experiences. Mm -hmm. So we, are, we really individualize each transcript to really bring out those students' uh, individual brilliance and experience. And so we, we've had success getting students into in the schools. In fact, most of our students this year are like getting into all their schools and they're like, oh, I wish I would have you know, shot higher. Mm -hmm. So, and, and we had one student who we just found out last week got a $60,000 scholarship to Clark. And we just found out another student uh, got an $81,000 scholarship to Quest University in Canada. So I, I feel like uh, we're having success with the colleges. Uh, I, I mean, I think, I mean, that's the number one question I get from folks all the time. And so how to address that. Thank you. Jason, no you, you mentioned um, seeing to it that students were addressing each of the four ends the board has, has identified. How do you go about doing that in, in a situation like this where it seems like the program is very much oriented towards towards being kind of free form? How do you, you make sure they cover all the bases? Great. So we do not graduate by Carnegie units. We graduate by proficiency. And so we've set those up. Um, and we're really one of the leaders of the state. We've been offering uh, statewide workshops on that that started two and a half years ago. We had like 25 people. And we had the last one in January. We had 107 people from all over the state to learn about it. And so what that is is we have these proficiencies. And we see those as like the end game. That's what you need to do to graduate from big picture. Um, so kind of like excellence is a standard, but the pathway can be flexible. You might do it through college classes, you might do it through internships, you might do it. And so in those, so if you take one like personal development, that's one of yours, that's actually one of our power standards, personal development. So students have to do a series of projects to show personal development, and they also do a major both presentation and portfolio on it at the end of their junior year. Um, so for citizenship, um, I mean, our students are out in the community all the time doing internships, which is great, and really, and then those brings mentors into the school. And also, they do service projects. Also, uh, for one, one month a year, we do a service learning term. And so that's a month where we focus on some service learning topic. Um, and that both for around locally and uh, it's, we want to expose students to, to diversity, and so we often travel with those. So for example, we have three possible trips coming, coming up in May for service learning term. We have one studying civil rights and homelessness that I work with COTS and Habitat for Humanity around here, then also is spending uh, a week in Boston and working with Habitat out there and a group that works with homeless people in Boston. Uh, we have one doing uh, storytelling and social justice. They'll be doing work with uh, probably 
well, they're figuring out what group they're going to work with around here, and then also go to work with some of the similar uh, organizations in New York City. And then we have uh, some people, we did this one last year and might go this year, that are looking at third world poverty, and especially around the coffee industry, and they'll do some work around here and talk to Green Mountain Coffee, and they also will spend 11 days in Nicaragua. So that's citizenship. Um, and, then, and then we have, uh, for all our academic projects, we have like, the academic standards, and students need to have a certain level of rigor around that. Well, let me say that sometimes, as a school board member, I hear complaints from people in our community about what's wrong with our system, and that's a good thing because we want to improve when we, when when we can. Yeah. Uh, about uh, about big picture, I've heard had more than one comment uh, from people in the community about how great it's been for mm. their kids or kids that are oh, related to their families and. And in particular, one particularly sticks out in my mind about a student who just wasn't engaged mm -hmm. and who really got engaged and did really well in your program, and I, I really appreciate that. Oh, great. That's good to hear. Thanks yeah. very much. Well, thank you. Unless there are other questions, we appreciate it. <coughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you both. And that takes us to the calendar. And I take it that this calendar is uh, ready for action. Is that right? We're going to have Stuart to tell us uh, all about it. All right. Well, yeah, tell us all I about it. I don't expect it. to take too long. I mean, yeah. um, basically, uh, this is the proposed draft calendar for next uh, school year. Um, it is fairly similar to calendars that we've had in the past. The major change, as I noted, um, was that last year we were trying to move towards a similar model. Uh, to the high school, you know, where they had had the TLC days, which had been a very successful program. But for us at the elementary, it really didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is unlike the site-based, you know, in other words, all the middle school teachers are here. They don't have to travel to get back to the class. They can up to optimize the time. The same is true of the high school. Releasing at 120 by the time everybody got to Central, which is where we did the two of the three days that we've had so far, it left a very short amount of time. And so, but the time is really uh, essential with the change in the curriculum to the Common Core, uh, with you know a number of things, uh, initiatives of the district. So the main difference with this calendar is it adds two half days, uh, students leaving at 11.30 uh, once in October. We already had the November day. In the past, we um, had a February day, which is still there, and we've added a March day. So that's the main change in the calendar. The rest is fairly similar. The only other piece is, of course, um, David had in the, this year had hoped to have all staff at uh, graduation. It just isn't feasible. So this year it's an in-service day, but we go back to the half day for all students for uh, K-8, which was our past practice, and the high school still is graduation on uh, next year. It'll be Friday the 13th. You can take whatever meaning you want from that. <laughs> Other questions or comments about the proposed calendar? I just wondered if there had been any feedback from families around child care issues or anything with the, the new calendar. We had not gotten anything like that. You know, the, the, the nice thing is, is that when it's planned, most people's daycare and, of course, schools out, you know, are able to provide for people. It's really more like snow days that tend to be um, a bigger issue for families or any other time that, you know, school was supposed to be in session. Yes, please. Uh, Marcy Murray. Yeah, Marcy. I was just curious if the board had a position on the extended ca calendar that's been discussed or appeared in the free press last week. I asked the same question this week of David, and mm -hmm. he said that he's been taking been involved in those conversations and we're going to keep talking about it so that was the answer that I got. So the board hasn't formally discussed the proposal okay. at this point um, but certainly I, I expect at least I know I read it with considerable interest. So I'm assuming there would be time for input from the community if you, if you I mean it's going to be statewide right? Is that I, I think the proposal is for the county isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's a little county. bigger than the county because yeah. it, the catchment is Addison County as well. Mm -hmm. um, and is, am I right in remembering that the plan is to ask school boards to adopt this for the coming school year, not this one, the coming the year after this? Mm -hmm. yeah. So 
there will be some time to talk about it, but it's certainly quite a significant change. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. If there's, oh, I'm so no, good. Go I was just going to say, if they are um, discussing this at such a high level already, and they're asking for input, will that be acknowledged at all? I mean, at that point, my concern would be that it, that input would be cast aside in favor of an agenda already made. Well, you know, we, we have had uh, an effort to have coordinated count calendars in the county for quite a few years now. And, and so <coughs> if the county is moving in that, that direction, if that's the, what we're hearing, that will certainly be a f force or an influence in the, in the direction of approving it. But each board has the responsibility to adopt its own calendar within the limits of state law. And I think you can expect this board will look carefully before we leave. And if they, if they were talking about not having the whole Thanksgiving week off, yeah. um, I, mean, I think what we do now is great, because you have the, te the teacher conferences Monday, Tuesday. It just adds a little more lightness to the whole week. So I'm curious, like, is that something that could be preserved even if we go to this new schedule? Or do they mean like not even having conferences Monday, Tuesday? I, I know I haven't looked at, at that level okay. of detail. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Anybody? Thanks. When do you have a sense of that? Yeah, I think it's it's very early in in the process, and, and to look at something that has a substantial change like this. You need something to react to rather than yeah. just kind of throw out a concept and try to figure out where it's going to stick and not. So, I think that's the intent moving forward. Is it's known as a vision calendar. It's focused on academic learning. It's one of its benefits is to not be pulling teachers out of. Uh, classes, but to have some intercession opportunities for professional development. So there, there are some benefits that uh, are, are greatly needed in what we're doing now to be able to really transform education, and this is one of the vehicles by which we may be able to do that. There's certainly no doubt that, that adopting a calendar like this will cause some dislocation uh, in, in the uh, uh, people and institutions that surround the schools. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that one of the theories of this calendar, the idea that, that uh, kids, particularly kids with um, socioeconomic backgrounds that are less rich than others, uh, tend to fall behind in the summer and that that's something we need to pay attention to. So we've got, we certainly, we will have uh, considerations on both sides of this issue when it, when it comes to this board. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, is there a motion to approve the calendar as proposed? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Calendar is adopted. Thank you. And that takes us to uh, policy D6, harassment of employees. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, we have uh, some advice from our council on this matter. And I don't know about the rest of you, I had a chance to read the uh, email, the advice, but I didn't have a chance to go back through and look carefully at the policy. So I'm not clear in, in my mind when about whether the advice that council has given has been incorporated in the draft, but it doesn't look to me that, that no. Okay. Outside of that. Yeah. Okay which means if we're in, interested in following the advice, we're not ready to adopt this tonight. Uh, but I guess that takes us to the question of what, if any, direction do we want to give uh, to whoever would serve as the ultimate scribe on this document? Some of what our attorney said, we anticipated um, and I personally did not have any any real objections to the advice we were given I thought it made pretty good sense uh, I'll just go on record to say that I think PHO's concern was that uh, the, the existing policy language causes you to do more than what you need to legally mm -hmm. The intent of the re state required policies, state and federal law required policies, is uh, to only um, 
only ascribed to the level or the standard outlined in those laws. And what he's saying is this goes further than that. So it's you certainly can do it. Yeah. Uh, you're establishing in technically local law through your policy. Uh, I think his advice is to be cautious in doing so. And I, I think that's a subject that, or an idea that this board has been cognizant enough from the beginning. When we start talking about this, we said, you know, what we're talking about doing is doing more than the law requires. And that sounds great um, on one level, but it, it also exposes the board right. or the district, not really the board, the district, to more potential liability if there's a failure to live up to the policy. So if we're going to do this, it's critically important that the people who work for us who are called upon to implement it, implement it effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think his advice really, well, you know, specific advice um, is that there needs to be a revision to reflect the fact that sexual harassment is illegal. I think that's a conservative way to read the law, but I expect our lawyer to, to uh, give us conservative advice, so I don't, I don't have a problem with that revision. Uh, any other com comments or thoughts? I guess, I mean, I'd like to see a little more specifically where is it that we are going beyond the law? Uh, I mean, because it's kind of more abstract. This is coming from you know, somebody who hasn't studied uh, this kind of law in many, many years. So, um, so I mean, I, I think it's kind of hard in the abstract. I mean, it's it's in here, but it, should it not be teased out for all of us to be able to consider? Like, here's something we're doing that we are not required by the law. Do we want to do it? Rather than just on a higher level conceptually. Conceptually, it's, it sounds like there's pluses and minuses to it, but I'd like to really understand you know, where it is that we're going beyond. So I can give you the, the, the major concept in, in, in terms of how this is different from what the law requires. Okay. The law says that if, if you, that you must have a policy that prohibits sexual harassment. It doesn't really require, the, at least the general employment law doesn't require anything beyond that. It may be that schools are required to have somewhat more policy because, um, no, I don't think they are. I think that's really all the law requires. So it's the categories that we're really talking well, about. Well, it's it's bigger than that because okay. um, when lawyers go to draft a policy that complies with that provision of state law that says you have to have a policy against sexual harassment, it sort of doesn't make any sense to not also prohibit the other kinds of harassment that's illegal. Mm -hmm. So race harassment, religious harassment, those kinds of things are typically put in most of the policies that I see. Mm -hmm. What's different beyond that is that we've taken really two steps. We, we take the second step, which isn't legally required. We identify other illegal harassment, which is against our policy. Mm -hmm. We take a third step, and we, we define harassment um, apart from illegal harassment, uh, and we say that harassment is going to be prohibited in our in our school district. We don't have to do that, uh, but it seems like the fair and right thing to do you know, to say that you know just garden variety generic harassment that isn't based upon somebody's membership in a protected minority group is still something that we stand against and forbid our employees from engaging in and protect our employees from. That's the, that's the real distinction. Uh, I, if we, uh, we could go back and do a red line version uh, that would identify all the changes that were made to implement that. That's the way it was done originally. Um, but that's the idea. The other thing that I did, because I have to own up to being the author of the most of the revisions, um, is I did identify a couple of illegal, a couple of protected, uh, or at least one protected group that, is, that was not uh, identified in the previous draft. And, and that is um, the idea of um, uh, protection from harassment based on concerted activity. So this is a kind of a sophisticated labor law concept. The labor law says any, any employee has the right to 
join with other employees in order to take action that is aimed at improving their working conditions. It's the basis on which, from which unions arise, is that idea of protected concerted activity. But not all protected concerted activity is in the framework of a recognized union. So two employees who are not covered by one of our bargaining units could get together and say, we're going to go to the superintendent and complain about this. And the law says so long as they behave in a lawful and reasonable fashion that they're protected from being discriminated against by that. So I put that in the policy as well because I thought it was very appropriate to do that. So my thought is if we're still solid with doing this, with taking on more than we must, um, and with the understanding that most employers don't do that, they only meet the minimum requirements of the law, uh, that we should uh, ask that the revision that Pietro has uh, suggested be made and uh, take it up again. But I certainly can get you if you want, Martin, the red line. Well, uh, no, I think, I mean, from what I understand what you're saying is when you look at definitions, it's uh, the definition of harassment there is really the key provision. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I understand as far as the, the protected groups uh, and, and your language in the policy above in the second paragraph where it says harassment is inappropriate and even when it does not rise to the level of unlawful harassment may still lead to employee discipline. So, I mean, the, am I right that those are kind of the key That's places? Right. Yeah. Uh, and I, I mean, I look at the paragraph of harassment and not the unlawful harassment, and and these are things that I think should be prohibited in the uh, in the workplace: unsolicited derogatory remarks, jokes, demeaning comments, or behavior, slurs, mimicking, etc. So I, I I don't have a problem with it. You know, I think as I look at this, I I haven't had an issue with the board's intent to being willing to kind of sign up to more than what's required by law because I think we recognize, you know, as an education institution, that's part of our responsibility to, to students and staff as well. <clears throat> this, I, I'm, I almost tried to read this one as if I've never read it before. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it looked really complicated to me. Yeah, it is. Um, so, I, I mean, I have to ask the question, are we overcomplicating this policy such that it creates almost an undue burden um, in the event that we, you know, we have a situation that you know our administration has to address? Um, so it, you know, it's a little bit counter in, to the conversations we've been having, but because it's. I tried to read it from a fresh perspective. All of a sudden, it seemed kind of cumbersome to me. Because I feel like yeah. I feel like the administrative responsibility in action is straightforward. Yeah. I feel like um, the definitions are straightforward. You know, in some ways, the I, when I when I read Pietro's language about. Um, revisions depart from the statutory language, then I started to wonder, did we um, overcommit in a way that um, makes this difficult to administer? And that's my basic question. Well, I think there are, there are two points that your question raises. One is the broader policy mm -hmm. point about, do we really want to afford this protection? Do we really? And I think the answer is, of course, we want to. Mm -hmm. The question is, can we do so? consistent with our other responsibilities to the taxpayers to not expose the, unnecessarily expose the, the uh, district to, to liability. So that's the big policy question, mm -hmm. and I think that's a de fairly debatable question. Uh, with respect to the complexity of the language, I think if you look at it, most of the complex language really is the definitions. Mm -hmm. And the definitions could be ducked because one could say, you know, um, that, uh, or when I say definitions, I actually mean examples. Yeah. And as I looked at it, that came from that came from the old policy, yeah. not from my draft originally. But um, 
that's where the bulk of the language really is, and mm -hmm. as a result, the bulk of the complexity. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's pretty useful for somebody who doesn't understand, you know, what this means. We could just sort of, we could just say instead of the examples, you know, that these I, these kinds of harassment are prohibited. So can I uh, ask a logistical question about yeah. this? If we were to adopt this broader policy mm -hmm. and then find that it's cumbersome to administer, can we change it? Of course. To be, yeah, but can you go back? I mean, can you cover less? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you can. So, so and, and are we more concerned about... Um, the administration not taking sufficient action to discipline employees who are undertaking or, or harassing other employees? That's where your uh, that's, legal that's risk where comes our from. risk is. That's, that's where, where your risk, risk comes from. Right. Okay. So so at present, you know, we're legally obligated to protect our employees against harassment based upon their membership in a in a in a legally protected minority group. If that doesn't happen, um, we could be held we could be account held accountable for that in court. Um, if we say, in addition to that, we are going to provide protection against, for example, um, generic harassment, and the, the employee is able to say, well, you promised me that you were going to do that, and then you didn't do it. Um, so you breached your, con your, your contractual, quasi-contractual obligation to me. That's where the potential for liability comes into play. Mm -hmm. So if we do it right, the law doesn't say ever uh, that we will insure an employee against harassment. It says we will take reasonable steps to prevent it. Right. So if we act reasonably, we shouldn't have problems. And, and, and the, the plus side of this, of course, is that it puts all employees on notice that these are not tolerated actions and there will be discipline if you're reported on these. That's right. So, I mean, I think that that outweighs the downside. There's risk. The other thing I would say about the risk is that, you know, we, we have insurance. If we make a mistake, it shouldn't come from the taxpayers. It should come from our insurance policy. That's why we have insurance, because no one's perfect. I think having a policy like this that spells everything out um, sends a message that we intend to have create a safe workplace. Um, and I don't see a downside for not including these things. And, you know, I think my question is, I, I agree that, you know, this kind of speaks to the culture we want to ensure within the district. Um, but we also, you know, we asked legal counsel for an opinion that suggests that this policy is broadening to include conduct that would not qualify as unlawful harassment. Mm -hmm. Is that conduct covered in another policy, because I think we do have um, treatment of employees and families and things like that, that potentially some of this could be covered in if we wanted to keep this particular policy clean for unlawful harassment. But would that, would that make any different any difference as far as a quasi contractual right that's what i don't yeah. know because yeah, I mean, i'm i'm looking at pietro's recommend or pietro's counsel and and that's that's my basic question right. where what's the right place yeah, if we put this? it somewhere else is it going to affect in any manner whether we're creating some sort of i think the answer to that is no I mean, if it's the official policy of the district people rely upon it and are entitled to rely upon it. Well, I'm just wondering if his, I mean, I don't know where, where his emphasis is in his feedback. Is it, is it in the unlawful aspect of harassment? I, I don't really know. If I were acting as the district's lawyer instead of as a member of its board, I think I would give, have given very sim similar, and I have given very similar advice to clients where I would say, well, you understand, you're taking on more than you need to. Mm -hmm. Do you really want to do that? I think that's what he's saying. And if we're going to take it on, we, we might, we, you, you're, you may be right, Elizabeth, we could take it on elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Although, um, because this is harassment-oriented, I'm not exactly sure there's a better place for it. But, you know, because that's what it's, this is about, is harassment. I don't, 
think we have another policy that is that specific. We have some well, we do general have, policies yeah. about the quality of our relationships with employees. I mean, a comparable policy in my mind, and I think we have one, is a bullying policy, right? Yeah. Well, that's for students. Yeah. Not, right, not but I'm just staff. saying, is that is this the is this comparable to yeah. a yeah. bullying? Because we policy. have harassment of students as well. Yeah. Uh, but I'm looking at your policy governance 2.2 treatment of staff. Um, it, it's at a higher level. Yeah. It, it's not <coughs> as specific as this, but it's discriminate discriminate against any staff member for non disruptive expression of dissent. I think that fits what Rich was mm -hmm. talking about earlier as far as the employment kinds of issues. As long as you're respectful. Um, then you'll be you'll be protected. Uh, emergencies, protections, personnel rules, uh, rights, responsibilities, evaluation, handling of grievances, protection against wrongful conditions, uh, nepotism, preferential treatment, those kinds of things is what 2.2 .2 is about. Yeah, in, in the monitoring report, uh, there's a list of here's what we do to, to uh, to comply with this, and it's make sure everybody's available, or I mean, everybody's knowledgeable about all these policies, and it lists those various policies, and it connects. That's what originally got us into this. It connected up to this particular policy, okay. and I don't recall that there were any policies, at least from that 2.2 monitoring report, that got to this kind of subject. It didn't get to this level of detail for sure. Right. Well, the policies that right that it pointed to it did not. Yeah. But if you're thinking about how else to do this. You could take the definition of generic harassment and you could put that, you could have a statement in our 2.2 policies that says harassment is prohibited mm -hmm. and then you could define it and you could do it there. Mm -hmm. The disadvantage I would perceive then is that you kind of have two places to look for around harassment policy and, yeah. and anytime you do that, the risk is that somebody who's called upon to implement it they miss one of the two places. Right. You know. Yeah. Rich, and the second paragraph of his advice, where do you think he intends that we put that? Because under the examples, it says examples of unlawful mm -hmm. harassment include, and it includes sexual harassment there. And then this says um, a revision to be made indicate that at least sexual harassment is illegal. Aren't we saying that by citing it as an example of unlawful harassment? You know, I, I do think it's there. I think you're right. But we could be more specific okay. and we could say sexual harassment means, um, you know, and I'm looking at the definition on the first page, unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, or other ver verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature, comma, and is illegal. Uh, I'm not, that's not exactly going to work because of the when clause, but mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a there's a place to put it. Is is there a distinction? Where? This is a dumb question, but is there a distinction between which of these examples of harassment are illegal? All of them are illegal. So all so of the examples are illegal. So I did only avoid. sexual harassment is the one where there's a statute which says. You must, as an employer, have a policy prohibiting sexual harassment. So, so that one should be called out. So you're not called upon to have a policy that says that you will protect people against being harassed based on their religion. Got it. Uh, but interestingly enough, you 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 probably are under legal obligation to do that. You're just I not obligated. I think that's where I was confused a yeah. little bit by his counsel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know exactly where it would go. But I don't think it's going to be hard to find a spot to put it in. Although I agree with you, Diane, that implicitly, you know, by saying examples of unlawful harassment include, it does say that already. So I'm just testing. I'm not pushing. Is it correct to say that the consensus of the board is that we should uh, add some language to make it clear that sexual harassment is illegal and bring it back hopefully for final approval? I say yes. I'm good with that. Yes, yes. Could, um, yes, I agree with that. Okay. 
the other question I have is I, I'd be curious as to where the revisions depart from statutory language. Is it just the fact that they're in here, or is there something specific in the language that Pietro recognized? Is that even is that even a worthwhile question? I mean, part of me thinks if there's statutory language out there, yeah. why wouldn't we adopt? There's a statutory that? model. Mm -hmm. Some of the statutory model, in my opinion, is inadequate. Yeah. Um, but you know, there is there's a there's a Maybe it's not even a statutory model. There is a model. Model policy yeah. well, by the school boards association. Yeah. Well, if it's yeah. just language where we add, I mean, where we added things, mimicking, name calling, graffiti, innuendo. I mean, if that's the different, I since he called it out again, yeah. it, it's caused me to ask the question. Where I think did, where did we depart? Yeah, I think if you wanted to know that somebody, he would have to sit down, or someone would have to sit down with the statute and the policy and draft you a red line and say, well, this is where you're different, mm -hmm. which could be done. For price. For price. Mm -hmm. Well, don't we have an original policy that? Well, what we had was an original policy was a model policy, right? Well, right, but it was, I, I don't think it way. went as far as the model policy went. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, we began to kind of dig into that. Mm -hmm. And then we merged some discrimination language with some harassment language. And then I got to the point and I said, I am out of my comfort zone no. here and we're going we're going to the pros. So So maybe for maybe for purposes of the next revision, if we're agreeing that we're gonna include Pietro's, you know, comments on sexual harassment, that we just attach a model policy or even the former policy so we know from where we came just to Kind of have one more. I look think at that's that. a great suggestion. If we had the model policy to compare it to, yeah. then board members would be in a position to say, "This is what we're taking." I'd like to be able to say, "We've added value here." Yeah, that's that's yeah. really what I'd like to. And, and actually, when I said that uh, you know we should add the sexual harassment as a legal language, there's also um, his comment about uh, statement that it's unlawful to retaliate against any employee for re reporting unlawful harassment. Yeah. Uh, or participating in an investigation, that should also be added. I think that's clear. Yeah, which it should be pretty straightforward. But there's already yeah. a retaliation yeah. paragraph. Yeah. So I will leave it, or the board will leave it in the superintendent's hands to figure out how to make this happen, uh, unless there's more specific feedback or guidance from the board. So, Martin, is the last paragraph. Does that one go under the reporting? Exactly. That last the paragraph last you were just talking about. Would you put it under reporting? It is under reporting, yes. Okay. Yeah. And I, I assume that that's where you can make the change. <coughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And do you want this brought back next meeting? I won't be here, so that sounds great. <laughs> yeah. I think it would be good that you are here. Because the first be iterations that yeah. we did, you weren't, and I think. Yeah. So if okay. it's going to be brought back after that, can we bring it back in conjunction with the 2.2 .2 monitoring report, or is that just too much? When is 2.2 due? Well, it's still, it's been kind of hanging out there since this yeah. issue was brought up. And we could probably do it at the first May board meeting. Or do both. I think that makes sense. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. I think it was a really good discussion because I think it was clear to the board, clearer to board members than it may have been that what we're talking about taking something on. So, right. a really useful discussion. Uh, that takes us to the audit report discussion. And we have a lot of documentation on this subject. Um, John, do you want to talk about it a little bit? Sure. Okay. Uh, we had we had four items on the management letter. Um, nutritional services is the is the one that's been highlighted. And we've there talked about others. yes. One is the funding status of our pension um, at seventy percent right now. Uh, I've been talking with, I've actually talked with 15 
pension managers in the last two, well, about six weeks looking for uh, doing references on reference checks on investment advisors and 70 percent is is I found some that were 60 percent 55 percent others that were 100 percent I found the whole gamut so 70 percent is nine points higher than we were last year still underfunded as far as how much money we should have in earning interest to pay our future liabilities so um, the the auditors the auditor has recommended the a note going to the uh, to a bank or a bond pension obligation bond and I've discussed it pretty much at length with the auditor about the risks I believe they're involved with a pension obligation bond or a note and that is if you borrow the money you immediately become 100% funded mm -hmm. but if there's a downturn in the market Until tomorrow <laughs> yes you down, downturn in the market then you become underfunded again. underfunded again um, so I could talk to him for many more times and I think we'd have that disagreement and we've we've seen some examples I know um, of, of cities that have gone through that so just I think the next steps are coming in that one there'll be a recommendation in May for a new investment advisor at that same time we should discuss the board should discuss the pension how we deal with pensions in the district as far as uh, do we need a, a committee to overs oversee that uh, maybe employee member uh, board member min um, community member because right now it's, it sits in my office I'm the, legally the trustee and and everything comes through me to David and then the board so that's that's a recommendation and then we've we've been dis in discussions about plan changes in that subject to negotiation so that's pretty brief but I think um, the pension the pension issue needs a fuller discussion in our plan probably in May also mm -hmm. okay and there were two other items before we get to nutritional services yes we have student activity accounts at all the schools no we don't no, orchard does not have one there are uh, there's a, a account here at middle or at um, middle school central Chamberlain and there are student activity accounts in the high school high school accounts all go through my office and they are reflected on the accounts payable reports that you see uh, for instance the coral band trip this this weekend to New York is a significant student activity where you've seen the the um, bill for the travel come through on our, our um, on the on the accounts payable and they come through our office at the at the other schools away from the high school there's an account set up where student activities they're pretty small but the principal can write a check and or delegate somebody to go to the store and buy a supply from this account for a specified purpose what's happened in a couple a couple occasions there is the person specified to go get the equipment or whatever small supply even wasn't told or didn't didn't know to not pay the sales tax um, so while it's a it's a small problem what happens at the at the administrator's office is they feel bad for the person I believe and pay the sales tax reimburse the person for the sales tax so it's it's not it's not a big problem the the bills you see that come through yeah, but it's always noted because we don't need to be paying sales tax we're exempt the second thing that happened is we had an, a new principal uh, newer principal I'm gonna say which one um, reimbursed herself um, 
a couple times through cash through this little account. She's the primary signer. We've set up all new accounts in the last year in coordination with our city treasurer. So, and all the bank statements come to our office. So these are things that we, we see, and, uh, and that controls there. And then um, uh, the fiscal uh, assistant um, goes out to the schools periodically and reviews, reviews things. So I think we're okay there. Um, but if we wanted to curb the sales tax, and completely do away, well, not completely do away with problems, but we need to move it into our into the business office and write checks through the computer system. And um, it would take the flexibility away from the schools. So we'll, we're looking into that. The software is better. We can communicate through, you know, our powerful um, network now. And these these accounts date back many years and for many many principles so it's um, it's kind of an old-fashioned way of doing things the middle school has a, a bigger account where they have um, for instance their drama they raise money for their production and that goes through this this school um, the assistant administrative assistant in the principal's office here does a wonderful job but it's all by hand and we we have to we have to reconcile that and the board never really sees that. You never see what goes through that account. So that'd be another reason to bring it into, into the business office. There's a, there's a trade-off between what the benefit of having those accounts in the schools is versus having better control, and we want to make sure we strike the, the happy medium there. So is there a recommendation on that? Well, our recommendation is... Um, our, our response to the management letter was to um, review, we've just kind of what we said, we review the bank statements, we act, review this activity, we'll look at the possibility of having the activity in these accounts moved and paid through our payable system to increase um, transparency and better control. So we're going to, we'll do that and report back. It's not, the, it, it's, it's funny, but it takes a while to get some of those changes made. It's not, Dollar, what's the approximate dollar value of those accounts? Oh, at the elementary schools, it's very small. Um, uh, $5,000 mm -hmm. in, in a year, and some of them it's a lot less. Okay. Um, the middle school accounts significantly higher. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, we went to the middle school administrators. And they were raising money, but they were also um, buying supplies for their classrooms and that kind of thing, and really student activities are student activities. So we, we had some discussions with their their whole teaching staff and got some of that straightened out. So um, it's once again it's been a process. Uh, you know it's it's still in the twenty thousand dollars in this school. Thanks. Uh, we have an issue with our our grants where our grants are accounted for wonderfully, except our ledger doesn't distinguish the the assets which are basically cash or accounts receivable in in the grant fund um, by by individual fund what I mean by that is our grants are IDEA let's just use these as an example and title three funds um, we know what the revenue is that came in for those funds we know what the expenses are and we we get audited all that's all that's pure but the receivable for IDEA and Title I would be on one big line in this fund. It says accounts receivable. So when the auditor comes in, it's not very convenient for them to audit this. So it's, it's really hard to change and do individual balance sheets for the, grant, the grants. I, I don't want to get too technical here, but it's really hard to change our system uh, we either lose our, our tracking on revenues and expenses or in order to get better better balance sheets so the audit's more convenient to the auditors or we continue with the process that we do have to make sure when the auditor comes in that all those accounts are <coughs> reconciled by, by grant so there's less work for them to do. That's what we're doing right now. Um, we are 
in, we're looking at the five-year financial plan, and one of the things is going to come up is our accounting software is um, nearing the end of its supported life. Well, it's been great. It's something we'd have to build into the next system to get these things right so they're better, they're easier to audit. So it's, we tried really hard to, um, it takes the auditor a little bit longer to do this audit. It's, it's like half a day compared to 20 minutes. And so that's why it shows up here. But um, I, without doing a, a few weeks of work, I think our, our plan to just do a spreadsheet that goes along with these grants will, will suffice for now. This is my thought. So just to go back to the first three items, because I have a feeling the fourth item may entail more discussion. The plan with respect to the pension fund is to talk about that in future board meeting. Yes, pretty pretty soon in May. Okay. The yes. plan with respect to student activity accounts um, is not clear to me. To report back to the board, we're going to look at the accounts okay. this summer again. Um, de detail what changes we've had and then make recommendation on on that okay and and um basically see if the schools can get along without them that's really without that capability that's what i'm talking about okay and the plan with respect to the grant funds is to reconcile them for the time being with a spreadsheet a until we get new new accounting software that's right okay any comments about those three items I just have one with respect to the pension issue, and that is to say that when we talk about it, I think there are two basic approaches to dealing with the pension shortfall. One is to borrow money to bring it up to date. The other is to, to pick a period of time uh, and commit ourselves to pay it back out of our own operating funds over that period of time. And I, I would like to see both of those options well developed for our, our discussion because I, at least for one, am not eager to take the risk associated with borrowing this money. I've seen what has happened in some other, that's how some other cities are way, way, way in debt and are facing bankruptcy. So I, I do not favor that idea and hope that an alternative to it will be will be one of the things we look at. Okay. okay. Anything else on the first three? Then let's go to the easy subject of nutritional services. John, do you want to? Well, take after us our that? After, after our meeting in March, it was the first meeting on inauguration night. <laughs> we 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 had a substantial discussion, and but after that meeting, Dave and I discussed. Well, do we need another accounting? Uh, another accounting. Uh, opinion because we've had RHR Smith's opinion and we talked about it and so I went to some colleagues and they understand what I'm saying but um, um, that's great but that doesn't help you and the board so Dave and I got together after that and we talked about well why don't we just go to the state ask the state how you handle a deficit we really haven't had a deficit since I've been here, although I know it's it, it in any really any significant deficit in in since I've been here the last five or six years. But other districts, other other communities have dealt with this, so that's why we went to Aaron Brodeur, who he essentially looks over all the audits and that kind of thing. And and I tried to. Uh, Give this a balanced approach to say, here's our audit. Here's what, here's what we're thinking. Here's what the board's thinking. I try to represent everybody here, and, and I, I know I, I looked a little bit, um, I was pretty matter of fact, Frank, about the number, uh, not to, not to try to minimize all the work that's going to be done on fixing things in the nutritional services, but trying to deal with where we are right now. So um, that said, according to the, the state 
law, um, VSA 1523, that the district has two options regarding a deficit, and they're listed on page one. I've done a lot more thinking about this. We, we had the law recently where our vote was split in A and B, and we knew about that almost at the beginning of the year. And uh, originally there was an estimate of, from me of $2 million, but then we got into the, the fine print about what, uh, what exceptions there were, and we had a plan. We went to the Department of Education and said, we think these are exceptions to plan B, what do you think? And they came back and said yes. So I'm, I'm wondering if we not postpone action on fixing nutritional services, but as we fine tune our number for our next budget year, which is when we have to make a, make a, a presentation to the voters, that we, we come with current information and say, hey, this is what we'd like to do to, um, to uh, alleviate the situation, and does this fit with state law and practice? And um, possibly have an attorney help us with that. I know I'm jumping to the end on this, but I, I think that that's a practical solution to at least this deficit that's, that's laying before us. So let me ask you a question about these options. Let us suppose that we adopted option one and we went to the taxpayers and we said, um, tax yourselves $347,803 to pay back this deficit. And they said yes. We would then deposit $300,000 $47,803 in the Nutritional Services Fund for which we have no bills to pay. Well, now what do we do? <laughs> I, I think I'm, I'm going to say it, and if, if no one understands me, at least I'm going to say it. Yeah. <laughs> Please say it. Because there has been a interfund loan that goes outside the current <coughs> fiscal year, it is becoming or has become a subsidy. Right. And as such. That's what we've actually done. We don't really have a deficit. We've subsidized the program. Well, right. We do have a deficit because it's not, it's a. I don't agree. It's a subsidy, but the other half of the entry is expense. Right. Uh -huh. It's an expense that's not recorded right now. Right now it all shows in, in an asset and a liability on two sides of the account. So once that expense is recorded, because it's over, it's longer than the current year, then it affects our bottom line and becomes part of our budget. Can we write it off as bad debt expense? Mm -hmm. Well, that's essentially what it is, but it, it would be shown as a transfer to nutritional services in fund accounting terminology, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it would be bad debt expense. Mm -hmm to ourselves. I, I know that. But we don't need to repay it if we're going to write it off as bad debt, do we? Do you know what, what I'm saying? What happens is if we record that as an expense in the general fund, we're all tied in with the state, mm -hmm. with our ed fund. Mm -hmm. So if it becomes an expense of the general fund, it has to be reported and as a, it becomes a statewide expense at that point. But it has been an expense to the general fund. Because the general fund paid the three hundred forty-seven thousand dollars as we went along. Yes, and there had been until this year expectation. Let's just say it's just me thinking that that the nutritional services would be able to pay that back. All right, but that said, you still haven't answered my question. Okay. We've now gone to the taxpayers and said, "Give us three hundred forty-seven thousand dollars more than we need to spend this year to run this year's school program." We now have three hundred forty-seven thousand dollars. What do we do with it? Well, we're basically paying ourselves back because we, the general fund. All right. So we take it from the school. <laughs> we take it from the from the nutritional services pocket, and we put it in the general fund pocket. And we now have three hundred forty-seven thousand more dollars in the general fund pocket than we have budgeted to spend. We can't spend it. 
right now we're three hundred forty-seven thousand dollars short in the general fund in cash, and we just haven't recorded the expense. We, we've we, we've recorded as a receivable. That's that I can understand. Mm -hmm. But we're not three hundred and forty-seven thousand. We haven't been three hundred forty-seven thousand dollars short of cash flow. No. But what you're saying is that from a balance sheet perspective, our assets are three hundred forty-seven thousand dollars poorer than they should be. Mm -hmm. But that, doesn't that ultimately mean that we're having to ask for that additional money from the taxpayers at the end of the day, or not really? Not really, it's more because of if, cash you, flow basis if you start that. looking at the balance sheet. There's a whole lot of slop in that process because what's this building worth? It's, an, it's listed as an asset in our, in our balance sheet. Uh, I don't have any idea what it's worth, but could it easily be worth a half a million dollars more or less than we think it is? Well, it probably well, is. You, no. Right? You were, um, more or less. We do better than that in what? terms of estimating Well, I don't know. I mean, what, what a building like this is worth is a very speculative proposition. It's, it's, it may be, may be very clear what it would cost to build it or to replace it, but if you were to put this on the market today, I defy you to come within $2 million of what it would sell for. <laughs> I, can't, I don't believe you can well, do it. Yeah, but you're talking <laughs> to the business manager, and yeah. he's talking about well, assets see, and the, liabilities. The this is a liability we have. have. It's not, this building is not part of the general fund. Okay. It, it, it's, general fund only takes care of short-term... <coughs> One year at a time, assets and liabilities. You don't see any long-term bonded debt on there either. Mm -hmm. And we have some of that. But what we would end up with is three hundred forty-seven. Was a three hundred forty-seven thousand dollars cash cushion in the general fund. Only because we had other circumstances that gave us a cash cushion. Right now, if we didn't, if we hadn't the federal money that we've had carried over, uh -huh. which is almost gone. Yeah. That's been our cash cushion in yeah. order to pay the food service bill. But that's what would happen with the money. It would, it would definitely go. That's the effect of the money. Is mm -hmm. to, is we have $347,000 more money than we need to spend next year. And what becomes of that money? It, does it just sit there? Does it have restrictions on how it can be spent? I don't have any idea. John will Why tell us. Why would it be reallocated to the places that it was taken from in the first place? Prior to being put in the general fund, right? I mean, it had to have been allocated to somewhere else that it was borrowed to be to be put in the general fund to pay the bill that we, you know, well, uh, that was. Yeah. So I suppose you, had you to could reinvest them into those accounts so they could be utilized. Well, if we spent, you know, I don't know where this money came from, but let's Somebody suppose does, let's so. suppose that a thousand dollars of it came from construction paper we didn't buy last year. Does it make any sense to go back and say, well, we're going we're gonna to increase the budget for construction paper this year by $1,000? Not really. No. It wouldn't make any sense to do that. We, we, we need as much construction paper as we need, and we should pay for it. We, we shouldn't say, well, let's put $1,000 more into the budget because we have it because we didn't spend it three years ago. Well, then, then if we carry that forward, your position is, Yes, it's a problem. Fix, a terrible fix, problem. fix the nutritional services so that it breaks even, makes money to pay off the debt, and go along until it's paid off. I mean, I think that's what, well, that, that goes, would be the end result yeah. of what you're saying. I mean, that was one of the questions I had, that if there's, you know, I mean, I, I did take issue with the comments that, um, the decision was left unresolved, and I understand that specific to handling the current deficit. Right. But my understanding was that the proposals that were laid out to the board included some payback of the current deficit over a period of time. So mm -hmm. what we haven't seen is a business plan that we won't see until there's a person in place that will say how fast and how much of that current deficit could be repaid to the district. Right, that's true. And that might be why waiting mm -hmm. until our closer to budget to to then get the plan stated right because that i mean that's feasible there i mean there's there's sort of two phenomena going on one is the current bleeding has to be 
stemmed mm -hmm. with, uh, with many of the suggestions that were already made. Um, and then the current deficit needs to be handled. And, and the operational changes, you know, can do one of two things. They'll either improve the current run rate of deficit that's being generated, but it wouldn't be difficult to start paying off the principle of the deficit that exists right now. And if that's a, I don't know if there's a time frame, John, beyond which, you know, the state would say it's unacceptable, but if that was paid off in five years, is that acceptable? I think that's something we should, we should, that could be our approach. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, that's what the auditor said, Ron, Ron Smith had said. He, he said three years, but yeah. um, it, it just is a matter of, does that, line up with this state statute. I, I don't know that. Well, I'm looking I, at the state statute, and it's kind of curious, because the first thing it says is that when a school district at the end of the fiscal year, contemplated by another section, has a deficit, unless the voters have borrowed funds to repay the deficit over three years or less, and unless the deficit has been refunded, pursuant to another chapter of law, the school board shall add an amount sufficient to pay the deficit in its next, uh, next adopted budget and report the total to the Commissioner of Education for purposes of calculating education spending. That language strikes me as being aimed at a total deficit for the district, not at a fund deficit. But then if you look at subsection C, it defines it as a deficit in a fund. Right. So if you, if you conclude, as I think you have to, that although it doesn't make much sense to me, the subsection applies, you only have two choices. You have to pay it back over three years if the voters approve it, um, borrow the money and pay it back, or you have to add it to your budget for the next year. Those are the only choices you have. Well, I was looking, Rich, at the language that specified that in both the public and private sectors, Accountants emphasize economic substance over legal form, thus a loan, in quotes, made without a reasonable expectation of repayment is not really a loan but a subsidy. And my understanding is that, and it, it refers to repayment within a reasonable time. So my understanding is that repayment is expected at this point, and in the absence of a business plan that outlines a repayment process, which actually could, even if you had a a deficit, a, a running deficit, a future deficit that was going, that was declining over, say, a one to two year period, the incremental revenues could fund the current deficit first and then the operating, if, if there's a timing issue, then the operating revenue could offset the rolling deficit until over a five year period it was neutral, for instance. Well, I read the auditing language as well. The auditing language mm -hmm. makes sense to me where the statute doesn't because... Oh, I'm not... Auditing, oh, I'm sorry. I'm reading... I, I was reading, reading auditing. auditing language. Yeah. Sorry. The auditing language says that, uh, that exactly as you described it, okay. that uh, a payment that's made to a fund without a reasonable expectation of repayment is a subsidy. Mm -hmm. We could have, in the past, said we're going to subsidize uh, the uh, nutritional services program by the amount of $50,000 a year, say, and we would not have had a deficit. We would have had the income in the fund to pay the bills, mm -hmm. and we would have paid it out of the general fund, and we would have raised the taxes to do that. That makes sense to me. He goes on to say, if repayment is not expected within a reasonable period of time, and I really don't think repayment is going to occur within a reasonable period of time myself, the interfund balances should be reduced, and the amount that's not expected to be repaid should be reported as a transfer from the fund that made the loan, that is from the general fund, to the fund that received the loan, that is the, the uh, nutritional services fund. That's exactly what I think should happen. I mean, it's, the, it's, we, we have in fact done that. We have transferred the money from the general fund to the Nutritional Services Fund, and our books should reflect the truth. And they don't. But I'm not sure, now that I look at the statute, that we even have the flexibility to do that. Yeah, it's, uh... um, 
that's what was that's what would have been right and I suppose we could make that happen over the next three years by saying we will transfer because um, well, then we end up with money in the wrong pocket <laughs> Well, we have transferred funds. I mean, this year's budget, we have a, what is $60,000? 60, 60000 for the next year. Transfer. Yeah, but yeah. that's okay. not going to reduce the deficit, is it? So is that a subsidy for the future dot versus that's sure. not doing anything? That's the right way this. to handle yeah. it. Handled it in the past. I mean, our problem is we didn't, as we were going, do the right thing and at the end of the year say, we lost $50,000, we spent it for the general fund, we're transferring it from the general fund to the to the uh, nutritional services fund to make it balance. Can't we do that somehow now? We can certainly. We can do the entry. And, um, once again, this, this with this language here, I'm not sure. Yeah, the question is, would yeah. it be legal to do it now? Yeah. I, don't, I that, I'm out of my legal depth on that one. I'm not a specialist in school finance law. I, 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 I don't answer that. I did broach the subject with our our attorney, Steve, and asked him that he asked him. That's why we were talking about the um, we were talking about nutrition tonight a little bit because um, I, I mentioned this to him that we might, based on what David thinks and what the board thinks, we might look to him in the future about looking at this. But. I, mean, I guess the quote, what we would have to do is we'd have to figure out what we're asking him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if what we're asking him is can we write off the deficit in the Nutritional Services Fund without violating a statute, I think that's a pretty clear question. Okay. That, that makes sense. Uh, that's pretty direct. The board wants to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd ask that question. But I think, I mean, I think what John said, I don't think we're at risk to, for this fiscal year to ask for, you know, get a person in place, develop a plan oh, I agree. and understand um, what, you know, what a three to five year plan is going to look like relative to the current deficit and, you know, accruing a future deficit as well. I mean, I, I, I agree with you 100% with, with this caveat, and that is I'd be very satisfied with the program if it paid for itself, you know, to, 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 to say to it, and, and you should pay the general fund back $50,000 a year. You know, if it would be easy for it to do that, that'd be fine. I, I'm not convinced it will be easy for it to do that. I, I hate to see it bear a burden that it is going to have trouble with. It's been bearing that burden for a lot of years. No, the general fund's been bearing that burden. Right. It might be yeah. easier if we get to that point to look at some of those places that we perhaps could justify subsidizing or paying for, for instance, the, the educational aspect of nutrition services, whatever we're paying for the farm to school person. If we decide that we want to continue with the farm to school, yeah. to, to at least alleviate that burden and make it really purely just the nutritional services. And, and to me, those would be recommendations that would come out right. of business Presumably. Yeah. But I do think in looking at the accounting principles, the accounting principles would permit us to write this off. Mm -hmm. You agree with me? Yes. yes. So let's ask the legal question. Can mm -hmm. we pay this I think off? That's worth. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Write this off. Mm -hmm. All right. That's what we're John. A question. Yeah. Does Gasby trump state law, or state law trumps Gasby? I believe because we're all tied in with the state funding that state law does. Okay. Trumps Gasby. Gasby's not law. Gasby's yeah. just. I know. <laughs> I don't even know if there's just something in the Fed regs. Best that, practice. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. It's amazing the things that are so complicated, simple can be so complicated. <laughs> that takes us to setting the agenda for April 17. So we can take off 2.2 .2 because we're not going to do that Sunday with the harassment thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. But the seventh reading should be magic. <laughs> I okay. want to see how many readings we could have one policy. This you don't really want to. You don't really want to do that. What's your record for your 12 years on the board? How many readings for the same policy? I have to say I don't remember. This is the record. This is the is record. <laughs> Any other changes required? Looks good. Looks acceptable. 
I, I would like to have some kind of a plan to. Um, <laughs> I, I know the park the future agenda items yeah. like what what can we do about that do we need to schedule our half day board retreat and put some of the these items on that to rest I think we do because yeah. that's just going to keep getting bigger as we move on we're going to have right. a deficit in future agenda items <laughs> no I think I we have a surplus of future agenda <laughs> items oh, that's true I get that wrong. we have a Sorry. deficit of board meeting time <laughs> right that's it so is is it the consensus of the board that we should run a half day board think, meeting and try to knock some of these off? I think we're overdue for a retreat. Yeah. yeah. All right. And then I think prioritize which because we will even in a half day retreat we, we won't, won't be able to do all, all of these. No. And I I would suggest that we take care of the ones that are um, that we need that that are more difficult maybe to do at ten o'clock at night. Um, you know that we need to put more time into. Do you have a, mm -hmm. a proposed list of which or which? No, I, I just know in past years people have kind of prioritized what what yeah. they think we should be moving. Well, if we think about a half day as four hours, uh, four topics, three topics, five topics, something like that. Five. Okay. Maybe five. Nominees. Evaluation model. Well, it just seems like a number of these are, are <laughs> waiting on things. Yeah. I mean, the F-35, future do. financial planning. Not going to do um, City cost, school cost sharing, nutritional services deficit. And there's four right away. I mean, community linkage is not, I mean. That's not, that's, that shouldn't even really be on. Community that's linkage can come off, though, you think? I think that could yeah. come off because that was really for budget. We'll put it back on yeah. again this fall. See, we took care of one. Look so, at that. So we're uh, yeah, down to I agree with the evaluation, though. That should be on high priority. Mm -hmm. um, I, I actually would put, um, I'd put the SB 6 and 5 ends policy yep. unification. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I, so yep. just, just so you know on that, Patrick and I are working on a, a draft on, on that. I just met with David uh, the other day to really begin to put in and see, uh, because while we call it SB 6, SB 5, and this unification. Mm -hmm. It's also common core unification. I mean, there's a variety of end statements mm -hmm. existing in the world, and we're, we're hoping to put together something. Um, I don't have a timeline on that, but you know, you said on a meeting, I make a timeline, you know? <laughs> so are we saying that that is something we should leave off the list or put on the list? Um, that? Whatever your pleasure I is. I think he's you know. saying it should be on the list because he's working on it. <laughs> Depends when your meeting is, Elizabeth. If it's really tomorrow, soon, really no. Soon, Stuart. <laughs> How about the city school cost sharing? I, I would. Put I think that's gonna. I hope that will resolve soon itself. I'd put city school, but I'd broaden the topic because yeah. we've got a new council to just talk about maybe how the board wants to be interfacing with the council and and the committees that you know Martin is represented on the form based code. Uh, but just to talk about any other areas, because I think I think city center is going to come up in pretty short order, and I know we've had representation there in the past. So maybe just broaden that topic a little bit. City so, school collaboration. Mm -hmm. So that should go on our agenda. Yeah. Uh, and personally, I would process? put. I'm sorry. What's feedback? That's process? been on for a very long time. It was. I don't even it's really about in. sort of a positive spin on complaint process. Oh, right. Yeah. right. And I think we, you know, we had this whole presentation and this whole sort of rollout, and but we don't know sort of how to, how it's going and where it's at. Mm -hmm. So, could do you think that would be something we could cover in a retreat? I think it's a question of whether the superintendent's ready for it. I don't know that we know that. Sort of a I, status I update. Ask. Unless you know when. Yeah, I think, in fact, I did some work on it today. Uh, I don't know that we're fully ready. And as Stuart said, I wouldn't want it to be tomorrow, but I think we can get ready. I think it's fair to say we're probably not going to do this in April. Yeah, probably not. No, it's we're vacation probably month. We're probably going to be May anyway. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> um, Rich, I, ready then. I would put the um, annual board calendar on that because that's a good yes. time to review. That'd be a great time to do that. We're all together. Yeah. And personally, I would put the future financial planning on there because the, the group has had at least one initial meeting. And I think it would be helpful for the board to frame some areas of interest, questions, concerns, just maybe a, a expectations. And that, because it's early on in that group's meeting, be, to be able to share with the working group. 
Just, John, you know, we, about that? we when we did a schedule, mm -hmm. our our first check in with the board is May fifteenth. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, and we have another one scheduled later. So, I just wanted to let you know that that's set, at least on in the group. And if it works for the board, it's it'll be so, there. Can't that, so that can't would that be on the May fifteenth regular board meeting. I mean, the regular. So it could be on that then. Okay. Okay, so uh, if we put that in, in May, then we have five items. We have evaluation model, city school collaboration, SB 5 and 6, feedback process, and annual board calendar. So that's okay. five. I think that's good. Can I just Seems throw out like another, another consideration yeah. that may or may not trump any of these? Dave has asked me to do some research on uh, tuition policy. I, 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 just to name it, I call it the China tuition policy. <laughs> because it's outside of Act 129 and mm -hmm. Act 269 and all the other things that we can get. It's from places far away. Far away, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, and by mid-May, by mid -May I'll have some research done on that. And so that, that can have some merit down the road uh, once legislature is over and we figure out where the dust settles on, on 269. I'm afraid we already know where the dust has well, settled on 269. Yeah. Crossover day is passed, and no legislation is moved. I, I, I think that the, that <clears throat> feedback and and won't you know won't be big time consumers. So I I think that's a good retreat schedule. The tuition, okay. okay. So maybe um, we should be thinking of some dates for yeah. for May. Yeah. First question is: Do yeah, we want to do this retreat. on a weekend day, on a regular day, or in the evening? What's your pleasure? I, I would rather not do it at night. I would rather a daytime, if possible. You know, the one time we did something um, on a Saturday morning, we were done by noon, mm -hmm. and I mean, it meant getting up early or getting out of the house early. But I thought, I thought that worked pretty well on a one-time basis. Yes, yes. My dog won't like it, but. <laughs> Bring, bring the dog. You can do it at my place, and the dog can be there. <laughs> um, okay, so, so Delina, would you uh, circulate a uh, uh, schedule request for Saturdays in May? Okay, I know the eleventh is not going to work. David cannot do the eleventh. Okay. Do we have a backup if there's no Saturdays in May that are mutually agreeable? I suppose that would be Saturdays in June. Or a day of, I mean, could we do a late afternoon? You know, that like four to seven? You know, that works better for me than Saturday mornings because that's such treasured personal time. Mm -hmm. but. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah. Sounds good. good for me. What else are we doing? <laughs> what was that? Mm -hmm. Is this is this an alternate plan rather than Saturday, or a set or a backup plan? Or maybe we could do them simultaneously. Yeah, I can send out a meeting request okay. for all of okay. them. But what did you say? To I said like four to seven on a weekday. I mean, of course that's not four hours. Four to eight. Four to eight's not too mm -hmm. bad. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. For the hard stop at eight. <laughs> We'll rely upon our time. Yeah. Well, I'm looking at May 2014. Okay. That's not bad <laughs> okay. Yeah. Say, Boy, good. my weekends are really clear. <laughs> really clear, yeah. <laughs> Does that take care of our future agenda items for, for now? And that takes us to uh, the minutes of March 20, 2013. Any comments or corrections on the minutes of March 20? I had a couple recommendations um, on the administrative reports for nutrition services. I had a recommendation that um, in the section that refers to um, a nutritional services director will be hired, I made the suggestion that a detailed job description for the nutritional services director will be developed and then the position will be filled. So it was. Would like that language to be added? Uh, I would like that to be added, yes. I don't hear any objection to that language being added. Do you have that language, Lina? Yeah. Okay. And then the other suggestion I made, uh, based on my recollection, 
was where it says Mr. Young said he would like to continue this for a two-year period. I said what my recollection was, would like to continue this for up to a two-year period, allowing the plan to be implemented and monitored, and if during the two-year period we see consistent monthly loss, a, a discussion will have to take place. As David says, it's monitored, and at the end of the two-year period, we see consistent monthly losses. So, and that I language is in I my. I don't see question. an objection to that. And again, Dwayne, do you have that? Okay. Anything else? That was more minor changes on page two regarding the methadone clinic. Uh, the second sentence, there is a status conference scheduled to take place at the end of this month. I just make it clear that that's at the environmental court. So there's a status conference at the environmental court. So people don't think we're having a status conference. Okay. Again, Delaney, have you got that? No objection to it? With that, are the uh, minutes as amended agreeable? Mm -hmm. Without objection, they're agreeable. That takes us to the consent agenda, which contains two retirements, um, one of which is from uh, Madeline Nash, who has been uh, employed by our district for 34 years. Um, and so uh, I would entertain a motion to approve. I guess there's no need for, there's no objection the consent agenda will be approved, but we certainly want the uh, superintendent to send the appropriate note to thank these employees, in particular Madeline, for their long service to the district. Uh, without objection, the consent agenda is approved. Any comments on the accounts payable? None? Yeah, I, I actually have one. Sorry. Oh, darn. Sorry. So um, the on the payment to Steve Marinelli, I understand that was, I, I got the answer to my question, that was a second mm -hmm. Hey, it was a, yeah, I get that. But um, I, I just wondered, is there, I, I didn't get a response to, is there some um, final report or recommendations that he had that the board could at least have a look at? Mm -hmm. it, his recommendations really are in the report itself that was presented to the board. I see. So okay. as the consultant, he advised us along the way. Okay. In fact, he's going to be in D.C. tomorrow. Yeah, we read about that. The first lady and five students from Milton planting a garden at the White House. Okay. I saw that. Thanks. All right. Uh, are there announcements? There's a whole list of them. Yeah, it's in, in your packet. I don't yep. know. There's some upcoming activities and some things that are happening. I don't think anything jumps out here. Nothing that requires public notice at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay. What was the date again on the um, on the big picture? April 17th. Mm -hmm. Oh, we do? We do. Oh, that's a you do. <laughs> yeah, and, and I will say Mr. Burke Shamrocks won tonight in San Jose. First game. All right. Yeah. Oh, it's, that's nice. Well, you want to move that April 17th meeting so you can... Is April 17th meeting, that's the next meeting? Yeah, I think so. Um, You're not going to be here either? Well, well, no, I'm just wondering if, if we can plan on... Uh, I, I can't, I don't think I'm going to be able to get here till 7 o'clock. Uh, and if we can do the executive session after. Oh. It's a science fair at Central School, and I kind of have to go to that. How about if you miss executive session? That'd be fine, too. You'll be down to bear three, because I won't be there. Is that okay? Three's enough. Okay. I guess I mean it depends on what, what we're needs talking to be about. brought up. Yeah, we'll have to at the executive session. So maybe we should find it. Check with David on mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If there are no other announcements, uh, a motion to adjourn would be in order. Oh, not to adjourn. We have an. Do we? Do we? Did we finish our executive session matter? Uh, yeah. I think everyone's did. satisfaction. I think so. Okay. So then a motion to adjourn would be in order. So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Nine o'clock. <laughs>